Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome once again to um, the grand finale, I'm sorry to say, of our Light Lunch webinar series. Um, I'm not sure where the last four and a half weeks have gone. Um, thank you so much to everybody for joining uh, today and for supporting uh, all of our webinar um, episodes that we've had. They are obviously all available online if you want to go and uh, review them and see them again. Um, our YouTube channel is posted in the sticky at the top, sort of over here somewhere. Um, so uh, please do uh, go and have a look at the previous webinars. Um, and also don't forget that we're currently running a photographic competition. Um, you need to hashtag light up your lockdown. You need to at multi lighting on Instagram and uh, you can win a Mathmos lava lamp. So um, a nice addition to your home, I'm sure. Um, so please do check it out. Um, so um, our grand finale, Marvellous Movie Moments. Um, this is a really exciting uh, webinar and I'm really pleased to say that we're joined by a very special guest today. So uh, with no further ado, I shall introduce uh, today's speakers. Um, we have uh, Mr. Martin Valentine joining us all the way from Windy Whitstable, I believe. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Daniel Blaker is with us once again, and Sophia Rourke as well. So, um, welcome, guys. Um, Hello. This is going to be fun today. I think it's a really lovely <laughs> webinar to be ending on. Um, as I say, for everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the support. Um, do keep an eye on our, our social media channels because we are going to be um, launching lots of new initiatives as well over the coming weeks of lockdown. So without any further ado, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, particularly about the, uh, the Ridley Scott anecdote, which is coming up. So um, uh, I will uh, hand you over to my very esteemed and capable friends. Thank you very much. Um, I will be moderating. So if anybody has any questions uh, or wants to know anything else, please type it in the chat and you'll get me responding. Thank you and see you soon. Thanks, Paul. Farewell, Paul. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, we're going to sort of take you through some of the uh, sort of movies that we think have had significant impacts, uh, both in terms of uh, the lighting industry, uh, the movie industry, and in terms uh, of our hearts. Uh, and uh, leading the way, I'm going to sort of do a little bit of a I'm going to start off, um, then Sophie's going to have a go, and then and then Martin's going to take you through some fantastic little anecdotes about things that he's learned through meeting people and his own learnings uh, along the way in this field. So um, let me just pop to the first slide. Okay, so we're going to look at um, sort of a timeless style in film, um, a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the sort of key uh, moments uh, in terms of cinematography. Um, I would like to put out there a bit of a disclaimer at this point. I'm in no way really qualified as a historian of cinematography to uh, sort of mediate uh, on this, but this is, you know, some of my personal, uh, you know, uh, interpretations of, of what I think is of importance. Um, um, here today, you know, there are other movies that, you know, aren't sort of covered in this that obviously are. Uh, the cornerstones of, of many of our sort of uh, upbringings. Uh, like for, I know that Matrix isn't in here. You know, there are a lot of cliche movies aren't in here because uh, maybe we all know them too well. Um, I am rocking a uh, David Bowie T-shirt. Uh, he, he is the Goblin King. Uh, again, the Labyrinth is not going to be in here. I'm, 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 so, um, although the man does rock a pair of tights like no other man. Um, so, salute you, David Bowie. <coughs> May you rest in peace. Oh, bleak, bleak early note there. Right. Okay, so um, sort of tying it back to the corona thing, uh, it may have you, uh, there's a, a fantastic uh, person at the beginning of the corona uh, virus thing, uh, make this little uh, sort of artistic interpretation of now that the air travel had ceased and you know manufacturing had stopped and the skies had become blue and the and the rivers and streams and lakes had become clear around Venice and things that the sky was now so blue that you could actually see the uh, manifestation of the Universal logo uh, passing over your local neighbourhood, which I thought was a lovely way in which to start this because um, it was uh, you know what a fantastic waste of time that was. But I think you know when you, if you have the time, why not waste it doing something so wonderful? Um, but in terms of movies, um, we're going to start, you know, you know, uh, arguably at, at the beginning. Um, now, 
there are a lot of things that sort of segue uh, and overlap in terms of influence and you know what is and isn't that sort of the first of, of any one thing but we're going to look at some of the, the keystones here and um, so the first one we're going to look at here is because uh, it's you know it it sort of epitomized a lot of first is uh, is a trip to the moon uh, by George Millier uh, in 1902 um, some of you may be familiar with this it has got the uh, sort of that uh, sort of classic shots, you know, come up later on of the of the moon with a spaceship sort of crashed into the eye. Um, but it's kind of some of the beginning of the black and white uh, sort of movies, uh, feature length movies, um, based on the uh, book uh, Jules Verne's book um, from the Earth to the Moon um, that came out, I think, some sort of fifty years beforehand. Uh, this uses quite a lot of uh, you know uh, fantastic uh, techniques uh, in its uh, conception and its delivery. Um, this is the moon still that I'm talking about here. Everyone's sort of familiar with that. It uses um, two things that um, uh, Millier sort of uh, uses that with, with his production, he built a huge sort of greenhouse, which is a, like a, a glass sort of greenhouse that the sort of stage was in to allow maximum light exposure from all sides to sort of come into the studio. Um, a technique that came from stills photography at the time and is still used today. Um, the way that he sort of uh, planned out his production of the day was in the morning. Uh, early hours of the morning to take everyone through what was happening that day and sort of plan that out uh, and program the day. And then in the peak hours of midday, when maximum sort of daylight penetration was coming in, that was when he'd do the shooting. In the evening time, he'd go and sort of develop those shots and sort of get on with that. And then in the uh, in the late evening, he would go out and take in any sort of Parisian uh, sort of uh, theatrical performance that was going on elsewhere in town. So. Uh, that sort of studio space was, uh, you know, something uh, because obviously light and artificial lighting was something harder to come by back then in 1902. So we relied quite heavily on daylight. Um, you actually, I'm not sure I've got a picture of it, but the the greenhouse that the studio. I'm going to skip to the next slide now. Um, oh, it's not in this one. Uh, the greenhouse that the, the greenhouse uh, that was the studio actually sort of features in one of the background shots. Uh, they sort of do an artistic drawing of of the studio space and actually work that into the artwork um, as the as where the workshop, where the canon's being uh, developed in, that, that's sort of worked in, so it's a nice sort of loop there. Um, the reason it's sort of black and white is the beginning, because it also is sort of the beginning of when things sort of became colour as well. Um, you see these two shots here, um, you have sort of the black and white uh, edit as it, as it was, and then you had a series of people that sort of color in the film artificially by hand afterwards. And, and I think you'd have something like uh, 200 people or something in a room uh, and each of them would be uh, responsible for a certain color. Um, I think in this particular movie, there were 60, um, 60 of the films produced um, to sort of for distribution around. And, uh, and each person would be responsible for a colour, and it's many, in many ways like a production line, and then sort of add that colour on afterwards. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's very vibrant, um, but a very laborious process. Um, again, it's a silent movie um, uh, of the time, so between each of these, these sort of uh, colourised uh, motion movie sort of moments, you'd have like a, a, a caption will pop up uh, with the narrative uh, to accompany the to the, accompany the movie. Um, true colour, um, and I'm sort of looking, looking at colour here because, you know, colour and special effects are a nice sort of vein to go through uh, the history of movie because something it's typically something that we all sort of get drawn to because it's the most dr dramatic and uh, sort of distinguished thing. Um, this is a uh, what is apparently one of the first true color movies. This is not a color edition. It's not a movie that anyone would have seen really. Uh, it is a, a bit of a uh, sort of imperialistic uh, a bit of document documentarial work. Uh, it's with our king and queen through India uh, and it's in 1912. Uh, it was a true colour process, so recorded in colour instead of uh, after the effect in edit. Um, a reason that, uh, one thing that happened, uh, I sort of found in my studies, is that early on, you know, early 20th century, there were a lot of work into, a lot of work went into developing different mediums to make colour, uh, colour cin cin cinematography. Um, the reason, it was, as back then, it was in a lot of people's sort of outhouses and back houses, and there wasn't a standardised process, and people were trying different things. So, in order for it to be adopted, typically it needs to be a standardised process, so everyone's making sure they're using the same thing from the same hymn sheet. Um, but also, uh, what sort of made 
uh, slowed it down slightly and made uh, black and white continue for longer was that they worked out how to get sound into the black and white movies in terms of the information quicker than they could do it with colour. So it sort of almost made put colour on the back burner for a little bit, for another sort of 20 or 30 years until you could get the sound in it. Because once they got the sound in black and white, it just became much more uh, consumable um, than a silent colour movie. Um, and a plus, I think this movie is only, this one here is only like sort of seven minutes long. It's not, it's not terribly long. Though. So I think more notably, if you sort of come through the timeline slightly more, you go into what is the sort of the, the sort of film noir sort of category or the black, the black and white movies really. Um, and this is uh, Nosferatu uh, in 1922. Um, obviously, if you're dealing with contrast and, and black and white, um, horror movies uh, and sort of crime and, and drama, uh, sort of a, a genres that, that fit uh, fit quite well with that medium. Um, and also about that sort of time in the early 20th century, you obviously have just come out of, you know, a, a world war. Um, things aren't necessarily, uh, you know, not that bleak and, uh, and uh, you know, sort of on the advent of another one. So um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, global a global conscious about sort of um you know um things that are just uh you know the head, headspace really in terms of uh, sort of darker darker times anyway um so uh it's based sort of loosely on, on count dracula um but again it's a silent movie uh and then we step slightly further forward um and we look at metropolis which uh is a is a feature-length movie uh, some critics say sort of almost went on for too long um, but it is, as I've sort of written here, the high watermark of the late silent era. So it, it sort of encapsulates everything that could be, like all the tricks that could be done really are in this movie, uh, capping off silent film. Um, it has a sort of political uh, sort of statement to it, as many of these sort of films did at the time. Um, and it, um, and it's just, it's really everything it could be. Um, as it says here in the slide, it actually was released the first year as the first talkie, which was called The Jazz Singer. So it really is that sort of datum line, that fulcrum point where it sort of splits off in terms of how movies uh, sort of came after. Um, very powerful in terms of its visual statements as well. You have here, um, you know, obviously New York is sort of going up at this point. This is when skyscrapers are being built. And I think the uh, director, uh, Fritz Lang, actually went to, he'd already started working on this movie, but I think he went to New York in 1924 or something, 1926, just before this movie, and he saw New York and he was really sort of blown away by this, this sort of cityscape and these giant sails of building going up that were like these white glistening bodies against the sort of the contrast of the sky. And you can see how that then maybe potentially sort of has gone on to in, inform this metropolis of the future um, that again comes up in other movies later on that's slightly sort of dystopian. Uh, next slide. Okay, so moving forward, um, where we have, you know, we've moved into the world of uh, movies with um, you know, audio accompaniment now. Um, uh, it's this is sort of one of the regarded as the first moments of the first of the film the first film of the film noir genre as it is a genre now the genre thing is is a debate um, that I think uh, is ongoing um, is it a genre that sort of existed between 1940s and the 1950s or is it a style uh, a style of movie and I think uh, neo noir is a, is a sort of uh, what many movies now uh, modern movies contemporary movies such as um, Hellboy, things like that, that sort of use a very similar sort of monochromatic, high contrast uh, format, um, sort of reference a little bit uh, in their in their production. Um, but this one is one of the first. Now, um, I think the sort of heyday, the classic period for film noir is, is 1940s and 1950s. Uh, I think it's sort of a blend of uh, what is influenced by uh, German expressionism. Um, uh, of film noir, uh, sort of started in the 1920s. I think there was a, a period where a lot of people from the sort of German side, German expressionism, were, were sort of moving around uh, the world as a result of political issues. And a lot of them sort of landed upon the Hollywood uh, uptake of the silver screen. And that's why sort of a lot of the influences sort of came, came from there. Um, 
interesting uh, uh, film noir actually, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, sort of, um, it's, it's literal translation is black film, but actually the sort of the more accurate translation is dark film. Um, and that's, that's sort of where that name comes from. Um, one thing that I also found uh, in, in the sort of the travel is that um, if we go back to uh, Fritz Lang in 1927, he actually did uh, a movie called M, uh, which was in 1931, um, which was potentially the sort of one of the first uh, film noir films. Um, so the same man that did Metropolis. Um, but the sort of the genre started in the 40s. Um, again, interesting, maybe interesting fact, uh, film noir wasn't the term wasn't the term coined for the genre at the time. It was actually um, it was called uh, that by a, a French critic uh, called Nino Frank, and he coined the term film noir in 1946. But it, it kind of uh, didn't come up again until the 70s, when it was actually sort of post uh, sort of uh, bracketed as a, a genre film noir, sort of after the effect. So it didn't really happen whilst it was happening. Um, so moving on, um, then uh, the gentleman, and I've listed director and sort of uh, the sort of uh, cinematography uh, guy here as well in terms of uh, citation, because I think they sort of work hand in hand. Something in film noir that I found was that it was such a strong medium in terms of film that it almost had uh, more narrative, uh, more sort of narrative power than maybe the, the, the words or even the director's direction uh, because it was so strong in terms of its language. Um, and also you found in film noir that lots of different angles uh, were used. It was, it was more about sort of, uh, sort of twisted or distorted points of reference or form. It wasn't just like a headshot and a still framed static image. So these sort of quirky angles came on. And I, and I like this one in particular because it's, um, it's in a film called The, the Painter of Light. Uh, well, uh, um, no, it's T-Men, sorry. This film's called T-Men. Um, but Anthony Mann um, uh, was, is referenced as The Painter of Light. And it's a nice sort of shot about um, just looking up through a lamp, which you know, I found uh, quite powerful because it's very much about contrast. And, and I like this sort of jaunty angle they've got here. Uh, again, another one, a good classic uh, sort of the same people sort of put together here, another film, because they sort of churned them out back in the day. Uh, this is Raw Deal, another key cornerstone movie uh, in the film noir genre. Uh, this is 1947 here. Uh, many of the <clears throat> the plots in film noir uh, with the sort of fame fatale, um, the sort of seductive woman that sort of tends to lead the man into uh, many precarious situa situations. Um, format and uh, most of them sort of uh, sort of anti uh, about sort of crime or uh, sort of anti uh, anti establishment or anti government or anti norm um, always getting into trouble. Um, the classic shot here again uh, the same people he walked by night but I've put this one in here because it's slightly later on down the line but it's using that classic contrast of through the blinds that sort of slit. Um, uh, lighting effect that is synonymous with any uh, film noir reference that people think of these days. Um, and again, another shot here using very modest means. It's a simple, more often than not, it'd be a simple point source or a single or one or two lights uh, offering um, a sensation of, of depth, as you see here, as they follow these police officers into the tunnel. Um, now, the third man, um, actually, film noir is really a, uh, is, an, is an American uh, film noir, French, French word, um, ge German influence, um, but the movement was particularly American. Um, the third man is regarded by the British Film Institute as being the best movie of all time, uh, almost, I think, it's up there. Uh, but it's uh, classed as a quintessential film noir film, even though it was, I you know, think it's actually a British film. Um, not an American one. So it's sort of sitting, capping the genre in terms of stylization and format, um, but doesn't sort of sit in the uh, in the American bracket of genre film noir. Um, as you can see here, lots of off-shot camera work, shadows, contrast, contrast. Um, the sort of the light uh, being elongated on the textured surface here, but a beautiful use of contrast through this tunnel. And again, the uh, sort of slit of light uh, across the across the face. Um, 
Now, moving forward, a lot of these techniques uh, were harvested and uh, you know, have been brought forward into other movies that would arguably uh, lead, lead the way in terms of uh, any lighting designer's uh, top picks of films. Uh, Blade Runner, uh, heavily influenced by film noir, um, just, just in colour, but as we all know, it's incredibly dark still and uses and relies quite you know, heavily relying on uh, contrast. Um, this is Blade Runner, again, using the slit uh, light through the blinds, uh, film noir inspired technique here. Um, again, basic instinct, moving on, very similar in the way that it's sort of shot, very monochromatic, high in contrast. Uh, but it's not solely about lighting techniques. As any lighting designer knows, you've got to rely on uh, the uh, sort of set designer or interior designer, um, whereas our set designers are the interior designers or the architects. And this is a movie that came out much later. This is uh, Doctor Strangelove in 1964. Um, it's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic movie um, by Kubrick, um, but uh, all shot in black and white, quite dark. It sort of fits the narrative of the movie. Um, but also I sort of found on my travels that it's, uh, the production cost would have been too high to film it in color at the time as well. So they also saved some money. So it was uh, serendipity that the sort of made made the plot work well in black and white as well um but you have here this fantastic set design and in this space there's this huge this, this is the war room in the movie and something that most lighting designers have referenced at some point at least in uh discussion is over a meeting room or boardroom table having like a, a hugely powerful uh light you know strong light element above the table um that sort of is echoes something similar to this back back in the day um but the set here if i move forward as you can see the scale of it the drama of it um a huge pendant as we would say in a lighting world uh, compressing the space and making the space feel much more intimate in what was a very cavernous space so that pendant doing a lot of work there to close that space down and these huge projections on, on one wall but uh it's you know set design is is key uh, working hand in hand with the lighting now, going forward slightly further, but not too much further forward. I mean, if we look back, you know, there's <clears throat> only four years between the release of these two movies. Uh, so 1968, uh, 2001, Space Odyssey, Odyssey uh, again by Kubrick, pushes all of the boundaries uh, in every single format. I mean, it's, it's almost... Uh, uh, you know, uh, criminal to just sort of say that lighting in this film is is what defines it because it's the score, it's the storyline, um, it's just the, the sort of the uh, big the big picture really of this movie is what makes it so profound. Um, but it is one of the most influential films ever made. Um, one of those lighting scenes that sort of stand out to me is this uh the set design for these illuminated floors uh, and ceilings and some of the spaces um using techniques that nowadays we sort of take for granted you know we have like side emitting leds and you know or uh edge -lit acrylics i mean uh which mean you can sort of achieve these effects with very modest and uh, modest spaces but in order to get this illumination with the technology back then they had sort of huge uh you know you'd be talking about sort of Par lamps that were, you know, four or five feet away from the actual surface of this. So this is a raised stage with lighting underneath it, but four or five feet offsets to sort of get some of these illuminations. Um, so again, wasn't easy to achieve, but obviously, if you have the strength of conviction, you can, uh, you know, uh, attain any vision. Um, Coloured light uh, being used to play heavily uh, with the storyline to uh, communicate a uh, narrative, um, and we'll touch upon some of that later on. But one of the things that sort of really stands out for me are some of the visual effects that rely on lighting. Um, this is the slit scan tool, um, and I this is uh, sort of travelling through the Stargate um, in, in the movie, and the slit uh, slit scan technique looks like some sort of fantastic blend, kaleidoscope blend of light as they sort of travel through um, sort of space and time. But it's actually uh, not, you know, CGI. CGI hadn't, it didn't exist at this point in time. So it was using these, uh, finding novel ways to create these wonderfully uh, intricate techniques. Um, and you can see here this kaleidoscope of light, very intense and very moving. Um, but it was using uh, sort of quite, modest means um it is uh, sort of backlit a uh, series of gels or filters that sort of move around behind what is a slit and then a camera that sort of 
uh, pans fore and aft, uh, sort of observing the sort of light bleed through through the slit, uh, creating this almost uh, you know infinite uh, void of light um, that sort of keeps ever changing, um, which incredibly effective um, using uh, techniques that just had to be made up on the spot. Um, this is what I found uh, Alfred Hitch Hitchcock's new Vertigo uses is the first CGI. Uh, again, it's uh, questionable whether or not it is truly CGI, but at the intro to the to the movie, you have this uh, almost, uh, I'm not sure if anyone uses the, the game as a kid, but it's like a, a spirograph, which is a tool that you sort of draw these wonderfully legs patterns. And in many ways, it's sort of achieved in the same way. Um, lots of these patterns and forms were derived from what was a anti-aircraft camera or guidance system um, suspended on a pendulum and it traced out sort of those lines. So it, it, it sort of is in many ways like a sort of a hanging spirograph plot, plotting those lines. Uh, but it was using the sort of very modest computer inside of here to, to capture those, those patterns and those effects. <clears throat> But then the first CGI, um, as, as we know it, uh, is actually in the original Westworld movie um, by Michael Crichton uh, and in 1973. Um, and it relied on a, a sort of an image compression technique uh, used by the Mariner 4 satellite. And these are some stills from the movie that relied on that same sort of pixelated half-tone image um, that is the vision of the computer, the sort of the antagonist in the movie is a computer and he sees the world in sort of pixelated states, uh, much more binary. Um, but a few years beforehand, uh, there was the uh, Mariner 4 is a satellite that was sort of you know flying out, taking images, um, I'm going to say of Venus, but I've completely forgotten. Um, and as it sort of sent this data back in packets, it was basically a color by numbers. Um, and so before they had the computing power, because uh, it took a while to process the information received, the uh, technicians could actually sort of, they knew what, what numbers meant what color. And so they literally started to write those things out on a wall and color it in by hand because they could do that quicker than they could get the computers to you know, re reinterpret what that information was. And it turns out that the painted by numbers was incredibly successful because uh, you can see uh, here it's you know the sort of level of detail actually sort of comes out very similarly between the two. This is the actual sort of computer decompressed uh, image here. Um, and then you've got the first live action movie. Now this always pops up in every uh, it should do um, in every life design is sort of uh, top top list because it you know so profoundly explicit in, in terms of its use of light. Um, this is Tron in 1982. Um, it was the first live action CGI, so it's sort of people immersed in completely CGI uh, worlds. Um, so there was no physical backdrop around them. Um, the uh, sort of illuminous elements to their outfits were sort of put in post-production. Uh, you can see here uh, a fantastic sort of still of them working in their costumes um, pre-post-production. Um, and uh, the efforts it must have been to sort of go to get that uh, wonderful effect and that luminous effect afterwards. And again, here's a, a wonderful sort of uh, still of the before and after, um, which sort of makes everything stand out much more, you know, everything sort of, you realise how uh, complex that process must have been. Um, the modern day uh, equivalent uh, is the Tron Legacy instalment that came out in 2010. Obviously, technology had moved on slightly by this point, and so as well as the, uh, the backdrops and the sets being much more luxurious, um, uh, they also, in terms of solar flares and reflections and other layers of, of lighting that sort of formed this uh, very uh, contrasting world um, in terms of uh, graphics, um, the suits themselves had integrated LEDs within them that uh, the actors uh, sort of said, you know, as as if you watched, um, um, I'm, the, not, I'm thinking, who's the guy that was in Train Spotting? Bloody hell, Ewan McGregor. As Ewan McGregor said when he was in the first Star Wars movie that he did, that because he had been a child growing up watching these movies, as soon as he got hold of a lightsaber, he was just running about doing lightsaber noises with a lightsaber, and he and he it was almost he he couldn't stop doing it, and they had to tell him 
you know, Ewan, can you please stop making noises? as we put them on afterwards. And I think in the same way, when you sort of, the, the actors that sort of got into, involved in this movie, they occupy these suits and because they've seen it and they've grown up being influenced by it, as soon as they inhabit the costume and it is lit up in the way they sort of know, they innately inhabit that, you know, that world in a different way because it's almost familiar to them. Um, so uh, they, they, the actors sort of said they even changed how they moved because of the way the suit was lit around them to make it more dramatic or flamboyant over, over that which they would normally move, um, exaggerating their movements. Um, as you can see here, beautifully illuminated. Um, it was also the first movie to have uh, six minutes or something of full CGI, so no actors, just com completely computer generated graphics um, with these light cycles uh, scenes here sort of charging around. Uh, and the modern day equivalent, similar sort of thing happens, much more weight on solar reflections and distortions and, and that kind of thing. Uh, and again, uh, backlit floor. So it's all, you know, it's all circles. Um, and then coming through a bit more, same year, 1982, um, taking on board the influence from what um, is uh, arguably the metropolis backdrop of sort of dystopian future. You have this sort of visual saturation or, or decay of, of the world as it's seen in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Um, I think lighting uh, plays a heavy part in this movie in terms of um, uh, sort of a, a character uh, within the uh, within the within the story. Um, it's not. Uh, it's almost. It's sort of. Uh, it's 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 too much. There's there's too much lighting. There's too much advertising. There's too much saturation. I think everything's quite overwhelming, and I think that also brings upon it a sense of disorientation, um, which you know, whenever you look at any dystopian future, it is there's always a layer of over information or over saturation. Um, which is reflected in a movie that came out a few years later in 1988. One of my personal favourites as, as a child growing up was uh, Akira. Uh, it's an uh, animation, um, but it relies quite heavily on that sort of luminous uh, characteristic of lighting. Um, there's a, a number of scenes in the movie, it sort of it, uh, rotates around some sort of punk kids that are growing up in this uh, decaying uh, future. And, um, and they just ride about on motorcycles. They're like a motorcycle uh, sort of gang. Um, but what I loved about it as a child is the sort of attention to detail in, in terms of the uh, sort of long exposure of the taillights of some of the elements. So the sort of the lighting really sort of fed into um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the story as it unfolds as, a, as another layer. It was, it was like considered uh, all the way through and evident in these, uh, these taillights. Uh, and also these, uh, you know, you can see that headlight is, is you know, massively bright, uh, which I always think is fantastic in cartoons and you can convey intensity, light, light intensity, as well as with the sort of electrical uh, discharge coming out from it. And again, the cityscape, uh, this is the uh, same movie. This is that sort of Neo Tokyo in the future. And it looks, you know, a lot like sort of uh, Blade Runner. So it looks as though there's sort of the future to come. Uh, there's a common language here. So let's not, you know, pollute the skies uh, with uh, lighting as much as possible. <clears throat> and then uh, in any uh, science fiction or any sort of movie, lighting plays a huge role in terms of uh, character. Um, traditionally, uh, safety is uh, homogenous, uh, typically warm, but definitely homogenous, as seen in Aliens, which is a, a fantastic movie uh, by James Cameron for, I think, anyone of a certain age. Um, but this is when times are good. As you can see in all of the uh, you know sort of aliens that have come throughout the years, there's always that moment where times are good and everything's sort of evenly lit and well balanced in a, in a friendly, understanding, and comprehensible way. Uh, and then, as soon as things go wrong, you normally end up with a very monochromatic, uh, very contrasting uh, scene in which you you can't see anything. Uh, and what you do uh, tend to see is uh, is the last thing you'd want to see which is uh, just shown here. Uh, it's a, if anyone's seen this movie, this is one of the best points in the film when they're in the walls. Yeah, if anyone, <laughs> they're within the room, it's a classic. Um, 
And at the end here, sort of almost film noir techniques uh, used throughout uh, James Cameron's movie. Uh, I know Paul has his own favourite in this movie, which is the scanner at the start of the movie, which is a laser that comes into the uh, ship to scan it at the beginning. Um, and it sort of sweeps across the room and using a very similar technique to conceal, uh, you know, the sort of the mechanics behind it, using a high intensity of light from behind the source, helping to sort of conceal what's happening and what rigging or whatever's happening behind it. Um, same technique used here with the loader. And again here with the Queen Alien, obviously it's helping to whatever rigging or uh, tools that are operating the, uh, the sort of the large scale a beauty there, um, uh, being hidden by that light. Also very powerful. So modern live action, um, in terms of the blend between visual effects and lighting um, being convincing, um, came uh, with Jurassic Park, which was one of the first uh, movies to have um, sort of that CGI crossed over with uh, real-time actors in a, in a very convincing way in 1993. Uh, everyone that's seen this movie will be familiar with this scene. Uh, this is when all hell breaks loose um, and uh, a man gets eaten on the toilet. And then we go forward to something by Danny Boyle. I mean, Danny Boyle is super theatrical in, in terms of his production. I mean, everyone around the world probably uh, simultaneously watched his uh, London Olympic Games uh, sort of opening uh, uh, Closing ceremony. Yes. Um, and um, it was very sort of flamboyant theatrical. But this is a movie that uh, sort of touched my heart because it's about sort of the sun and something that's, uh, you know, very profound in terms of what we do, but also, you know, why everything is here. Um, and it plays a key role in this movie, Sunshine, where they're traveling towards the sun. And as they get closer to it, they have this uh, interchange uh, in, in a sort of a dialogue with their relationship with the sun. Uh, very monochromatic, almost, um, with the sort of uh, sort of sodium-esque yellow that comes from the sun um, as they look at it through this filter. But it is 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 very beautiful and stunning to watch. Um, inside the ship, uh, typically science fiction, um, uh, very restricted use of uh, lighting in terms of uh, palettes, um, fu very functional, um, normally helping to. Uh, show distinction between worlds or scenes and used to no greater effect uh, lighting in the more contemporary movie uh, Ex uh, Machina in 2015 by Alex Garland. Uh, it's a subterranean workshop space um, where the sort of genius works on his um, AI robots. Um, but in the subterranean world, there's no or workshop, there's no uh, uh, natural lighting. And so all the lighting is uh, and the sort of the tone of the movie is conveyed by the use of a few uh, dedicated sources of artificial lighting. And you can see in this scene here, there are on the left hand side, adjacent to the concrete wall, there are linear strips, both in the floor and the ceiling um, that contain both uh, a cool white light and a warm white light source as well as the sort of the illuminated glazing on the on the right hand side in that sort of more uh, cubic form and a balance and a, play, a, a careful balance of the operation of these light sources and the color temperatures which we all rely on quite heavily uh, in our designs nowadays as lighting designers um, communicate different times of day or different uh, demands in terms of use uh, you can see here that cubic form in the middle sort of uh, playing sort of second fiddle to the now illuminated uh, cool white strips on the perimeter concrete and then uh, when things sort of go to pot the same sort of light sources are uh, used in a very sort of red uh, normally meaning danger state and um, but all coming from the same location and the same source um, and also there's a, a warm white light if I go back but I haven't actually got a slide for it uh, there's a much more domestic uh, warm white light uh, that comes from these linear strips as well, but sometimes only illuminated from the floor. That is that sort of late night evening scene that when we're looking at uh, sort of um, contemporary life and design that we do for residential or hospitality, you, you are normally looking to have uh, some amount of layering to the space to help it achieve different moods. Maybe not that mood. I think that mood might be too much. Um, and some of my personal favourites, um, I've some of them I've touched upon in this movie, but another one I, I haven't mentioned, but it is stunning in terms of its almost simplicity. Well, it, it looks simple, but I'm sure it's uh, it's incredibly uh, complicated in its conception. 
um, as most simple things are, um, by uh, Michael and Michelle Gondry. Um, and it's a, it's a journey through uh, someone's mind. Uh, and as a result of that narrative of what are sort of lucid memories or lucid thoughts, it's almost akin to a dream state. And in that sort of uh, passage through one thought to the next thought of consciousness, um, very sort of uh, simple but stunningly visually effective uh, techniques are used. I'll, I'll sort of uh, recount one of them, and it's that in one of the scenes is in a library which is lit by uh, sort of standard uh, modular ceiling grid fluorescent lights. And as he transitions and leaves that space and goes into the next space, those fluorescent lights sort of slowly one by one from the background, you know, turn off as you go from one space into the next space. So that that memory or that you know that scene's been deleted, um, but just simply using the fluorescence and, the, and so the lights that are native to the space, um, and it's quite powerful. So I think that is uh, sort of a very um, you know uh, whistle stop tour through what is uh, some of the moments that I, I feel are important in the terms of uh, history of lighting and movies. And we're going to lead you on now to some of the more emotional elements with the lovely Sophie. Hi everyone. Um so I'm particularly interested in light as a technique to sort of manipulate emotions and tell a story. Um, and I've sort of been looking at the intersection between film and lighting design and sort of how we borrow elements from each other in these sort of two worlds. And it's by no means a definitive list of techniques. It's just a few that I thought were really nice. So if you look at high contrast, uh, this is something that we as lighting designers do when we want to create a bit of drama or texture in a space. Love this sort of we might have pools of light and dark next to each other. And similarly in film, um, they've always used high contrast to create suspense and fear within the viewer. It sort of, it can hide and distort faces. Um, I think the best genre for doing this, in my opinion, is horror. I'm a big horror fan. I think the lighting can be really amazing and artistic and maybe sometimes people shy away from horror because obviously it's pretty scary, but I think it can be some of the most beautiful film work. Um, I hadn't actually hadn't seen Hannibal until I was chatting to Martin recently and he convinced me to watch it and um, it's so good. And I think it's such a good example of using high contrast lighting to really sort of hide and distort faces and it brings uncertainty to the scene and it's, you can't read what's going on in people's faces properly so you can't really tell what's going on. Um, there's often like shadows and shafts of light going across uh, Anthony Hopkins' face and I think it's just a really good technique that they use there. Um, so Battle Royale is another film that I think that uses this really, really well. It's a Japanese horror film, which is basically The Hunger Games, but it came way before The Hunger Games. So this was the inspiration for The Hunger Games. Um, there's lots of shots of sort of shadowy shots of, and beams of light with torches as kids are running through the forest or trying to kill each other. And it, I mean, very Blair Witch, it does, that's another quite influential film for this sort of thing. And it just means you, you can't see details, you don't know what's lurking in the shadows. It's a pretty human thing to be afraid of the dark and it just inherently makes you feel uneasy. And yeah, this is a very good horror film for doing that, as you can see here. So another film I think that uses this really well um, is Suspiria. It's an Italian horror film from the 70s. Um, they basically light it like a theatre set. It's highly saturated, high contrast colour that fills uh, the story whenever something sinister is happening or about to happen. So often the lighting can start to change before the danger comes and it kind of makes you as the viewer, you're sort of in on the secret, you know something's about to happen even before the characters do. Uh, it's often, oops, sorry, there you go. Um, it can often be these sort of deep blood reds uh, and there's an awesome film where the ballet students at the school, they live in the school, they're staying in the hall because there's been something happened. I won't spoil it. Um, and they're all there getting ready and going to sleep. And then the lights go out, the teachers turn the lights out and you can suddenly see what the teachers are doing behind the curtains. I mean, it's straight off a film set, but I think it just works so well in this film. And that leads us to low contrast. So, this film and a lot of others, they can use these sort of low contrast moments, like in horror films, they use the low contrast moments to bring a moment of reprieve. You can sort of relax in your seat, you can take a breath, you know, the characters are safe, you're feeling safe, and it sort of allows the 
really intense moments to be really powerful because you have these moments of reprieve in between. That's another thing from Suspiria. So I think uh, the movies of Hayao Miyazaki, I think are really a really good example of this as well. They can uh, sort of flip between the high and the low contrast. They are hand-drawn animations, so everything, every little painstaking detail is there for a reason. I think they're able to use film, uh, able to use light, sorry, like on a film set, but all animated, and they're capable of moving from these really safe, lovely scenes like this one here into these really shadowy, dark, sort of scary scenes with shadows being cast across faces and red light sort of bleeding into the sky. And as lighting designers, we often use low contrast and diffuse lighting if we want to show details. So um, in retail, it's a good example. We'll often use uh, low contrast lighting on products if you want. If we want it to really like, you want to see all the details of the product and the packaging. So someone I couldn't go past sort of a, lo a low contrast topic without talking about was Wes Anderson. Um, it's deliberate, it's detailed, it, it's, it's created to see every single little element. The whole thing is a visual masterpiece. And even the scenes at night, as seen here, are completely, they're bright, they're blue, you can see every detail, you know what's going on, there's never sort of any surprises hiding around the corner, there's no secrets, what you see is what you get. Now, movement is something else I think is really interesting that they can use in film sometimes. Um, in lighting, we might use this in sort of experiential light art. When we really want to convey like an extreme experience or emotion to someone, you might throw them in a room of swirling light if you want to really disorientate them or throw them off. And a film that does that extremely well is Enter the Void. Um, this movement and these strobing light sources can make the viewer feel really disorientated, and this film does that in buckets. Um, essentially, I mean, it, the, the topic of the film itself, maybe not the best, but experimentally for light, I think it's so, so interesting. It's just, there are scenes where it's literally just strobing light. At, like, I mean, if you have epilepsy, please don't watch this film, honestly, but it just strobes and strobes and strobes. And these scenes can be really, really difficult to even get through, like yourself. It's, it's hard to watch them, but the topics in the film are also really hard to watch. And so it kind of goes hand in hand and it's just a really, it's just super experimental and a really interesting way of doing it. Like they're nauseating, but so is the topic of the film. So it all makes sense. And they juxtapose these really intense strobing sort of scenes. I mean, this one here, they, there's a lot of drug use in the film and they literally show the scene deteriorating in front of your eyes and turning into a drug trip. And they sort of take you on these visual journeys of animations, which are just hectic. But then they'll sort of intersplice it with these beautiful, soft, static, gentle scenes, which are all these uh, flashbacks of him as a child or him with his sister. And they're, yeah, these really nice sort of reprieves to the sort of chaos that is the rest of the film. The film also takes sense, uh, takes, is set, sorry, in the neon streets of Tokyo which is another sort of element of visual overload. And I mean, this really goes to show that actual production design and set dressing of a film can really add to the sto uh, story as light can be very visually noisy. So here is God's Own Junkyard in London. It's sort of a bar slash neon sign manufacturer. Um, and we as line designers, we will go here to get signs made. Like we, we add these sort of decorative elements to a space, like a pendant to a dining room or, you know, a sign to a, to a bar. And they're the finishing touches and details that like help set o uh, the overall scene. Of course, Blade Runner couldn't go without talking about Blade Runner. Um, the use of neon and fluoro lighting in Blade Runner really helps sort of add, like Dan was saying before, to the sensory overload and they help really indicate that you're sort of not not in this world or not at this time in the, um, in the set. So colour is another one. Colour is something that is used to emotionally manipulate us. And an example of, um, of it in lighting is here with Oliver Eliasson's The Weather Project. It's using very peaceful, gentle, warm, glowy light that's meant to sort of represent the sun. 
that makes you feel really comfortable. And uh, opposed to that, people might use blues or greens, um, sort of hues of light to make everything feel a bit uncomfortable and to make sort of make your skin look unnatural and make you feel and look a bit sick. So there are many instances in which film has uh, used these elements to sort of enhance the story, sort of, you know, warms to indicate safety or love and juxtapose it with cools to, you know, convey anger and sadness. And I think a film that does that really well, it uses both of the techniques together, is A Single Man by the uh, fashion designer Tom Ford. I know Drive does this really well as well, but I just wanted to focus on this film. So it's about this man who's given up on everything and he's, you know, he's co uh, contemplating suicide and it's this really awful sort of beginning. And as he sort of moves through the film and starts to see joy in elements of life again, things become highly saturated and they, they warm up around him, particularly when he's talking to uh, Nicholas Holt's character. It can go from these really sort of cool, harsh scenes to these really saturated, warm, lovely scenes. And this happens in particular as well in this film with his flashbacks and much like with Enter the Void. And it also happens really well, I think, in Solaris, which I think Martin's going to talk about later. Um, but yeah, it's commonly used in film. I think it's a really, really powerful one for really helping you tell what's going on with that emotion. So my top picks. I've picked two Australian films here, one Australian horror and one Australian cult classic. We've got um, The Loved Ones and The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Um, simply, this is just a really interesting exercise to watch both these films and just look at the quality of light in the scenery. So obviously with The Loved Ones, the Australian outback is like sickly green and horrible, but with Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, it's very realistic, it's very warm and bright and beautiful. And then of course, horror films, the two I talked about, I think Suspiria is just beautiful. It's done so well. And I think Battle Royale, apart from just being an amazing film, is really, really, really perfect with the way it does its um, sort of horror lighting. And then animation, I think Studio Ghibli is a really good, like they, they, everything they do is beautiful, hand-drawn, deliberate, like it's, there's such good examples of light in animation. Um, so we've got Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away at the top, which is this fantasy film, which is, I mean, if you haven't seen it, you just have to. It's so beautiful. And then the one underneath is Grave of the Fireflies by Isao Takahata. And it is about World War II. It's about these two children during World War II. It's heartbreaking, but it's stunning. So enough of me. On to Martin Valentine. Hell. <laughs> Okay, I'll take control. All right, so um, I'm going to get Blade Runner out straight away. Um, I've said it before, I think, in articles that uh, it's the single reason I'm a lighting designer. It's the thing I go back to the most, the thing that I cannot grow out of. Um, <clears throat> but as the years go by and, and I sort of delve into it, and I say I did get a chance to meet Ridley Scott, which I'll, I'll sort of mention a few things that he said uh, later on in, in my section. Um, but this look of Blade Runner, it was influenced by things like Citizen Kane and um, uh, Seven Samurai, films like this. But generally, it is lit by two lights with two guys running around, uh, lighting from behind and lots of smoke. So Ridley Scott said to me, if you like the look of Blade Runner, just put lots of smoke in a room and light and backlight. And that is basically this look and feel of a film uh, that I absolutely love. And the other thing that's um, important about Blade Runner, it's it's the um, the eyes. Everything is what you see with the eyes and everything is what you see in the eyes. And one of the things that's come out is that how to tell if someone is, is real or not real. Uh, this trick of the red eyes is actually very, very simple. It's the opposite of we all try to avoid with getting red eye with a, an old fashioned camera with the flash very close to the lens. You put the you put the light behind the lens, line it in the eyes. It reflects back through the eyes. It was a very, very deliberate uh, trick that Ridley Scott played. So you could you could see who was uh, so to be artificial or are they? Um, another little trick, uh, we've not mentioned it yet, but this thing about this, um, the golden owl, this blue light that we see in things like La La Land and The Revenant, uh, and we all know about taking the best photographs of our projects at night is don't wait for it to get dark, just get that perfect thing with the sky still blue. Um, 
but um, Bertolucci in The Conformist in the 70s, he did the opposite. He actually used um, the, the, the first dawn light, so 5, 6 a.m. In, 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 uh, in the summer, to film Paris. And if anyone's been to Paris, it's a beautiful city, but it never quite looks like it does in the movies. But it, it will do if you get up at 5 or 6 a.m. and see scenes like this. So everything in this film is, is like the... The, the 12 hour opposite of the Revenant magic hour. Everything is dawn. Everything is the rising sun. And it has a unique look. Um, but it's something that seems to be forgotten about recently, actually, how to, how to sort of tune the time of day to actually get a consistent look. Uh, this is Angel Heart. This is Alan Parker. And Alan Parker had a big history of uh, theatre work. Uh, he was also heavily influenced by things like uh, Eight and a Half, uh, Fellini's film, which was very much a case of using the shadows. Um, this film is about a journey. Something is being followed. This person is also being followed themselves. So there's lots of focus on where to go. Lots of light in single windows, single doors, but never actually finding what's on the other side. So it builds up the tension, all using very much typically used theatrical tricks. Uh, in the Citizen Kane itself, which I think is considered to be one of the best films in the world, there's many, many things to take from this film. You know, it, bearing in mind this is, you know, in 1940, uh, 41, um, you can see what influenced Blade Runner here. One of the things that um, Citizen Kane brought is uh, sets, often before this time. Uh, and again, this led into the film noir um, sort of following this. There were three rooms, three walls, no ceiling, it was just studio lights. And as this film goes on, we start to see the ceilings and it's very, very deliberate. The camera moves down and the ceilings become more and more prevalent in the scenes to, to see the world coming down onto the Orson Welles character who's only about 27, by the way, on the left there when he played this. Um, and since then, they started using this a lot more, these unusual camera angles in a lot of the cheaper films, which is a lot what um, film noir used to be. I have to mention the Coen brothers. Um, and then see uh, Roger Deakins, a uh, fantastic DOP that works with them an awful lot, I think nearly all their sort of uh, recent films. But Fargo was an interesting one just to hear about uh, how to they actually pull you know a location um color and how to focus attention so it was supposed to be cold and it wasn't particularly cold so they had to ship in snow and this is a scene that's filmed in a bar um if you look to the left that is george rr R. martin making a cameo appearance um back in the day um so in scenes like this to make it actually feel colder outside and more intimate inside they used to, he put 1,000, 2,000 watt GLS lamps in, in the, all the lighting inside the bar and dimmed it right down to get that contrast when in fact it was actually quite nice and sunny outside. And scenes in here, um, we talk about, I think someone mentioned about science fiction gives more play to play around with lighting. Well, this just this one scene to get this focus of this, this conversation, 6,500 Kelvin lamps in all of the workshop and 2,000 um, or dimmed tungsten uh, source right on the two main characters to, to stop this whole scene being flat and this Fargo has a lot of use of this from warm to cool to actually make you feel like the characters and the, I think one of the best tricks is science fiction here we have science fiction done in the Jean-Luc Goddard way which is to just use different film stock literally this is Paris the whole of Alphaville which is supposed to be another planet is Paris filmed with this bled out overexposed high contrasty uh, film stock and it looks fabulous and the, the thing is that light in this film also is a protagonist light becomes this um, invasive state who's observing a bit like Big Brother and the more that you watch this film the more that you see this light as it as a symbol of like you're not safe and it almost takes over many aspects of the film. And 2001, Kubrick is, is one of my sort of favorite directors and it's just the layers of what he had to do. He was basically ahead of his time. He was born too early. If he was operating today, he has everything that he was actually looking for. This scene, or well, these scenes in 2001, um, we'd love to have shown some clips, but we weren't able to. If you imagine how they filmed this before, as Dan said, there was computers. Um, they spent what would be today about six and a half to seven million pounds to build a carousel where the actors were static like a hamster in a cage and cameramen were strapped around this um, this carousel as it was rotating around. No fluorescence. Everything was uh, one, two thousand watt par lamps. Even the computer screens that are on this they weren't computers. So the computer screens are gel animation back projected. 
everyone was in a cage because this this whole thing sounded like rattled glass because all of these lamps were exploding the heat was intense and this this glass was raining down on on the director and everything this is the length to go to for just film today we could have done that in post very very easily and then to go back as well this is an interesting film latro this is um sort of acknowledged to sort of be the end of the old style of French cinema before the new wave started. It's a prison escape drama that's kind of faded into obscurity, but has just come back with the criterion. Uh, it is a lot filmed with a single candle, um, a lot following people's nose, a lot looking through slots and keyholes. Latro means the hole. It's, it's set in the Sante prison in Paris, which is still one of the top 10 worst prisons in the world. Um, I don't want to spoil this film, um, but it's something which at the time made a big impact. It was a very, very popular film and it just disappeared. Um, I'll come back to this at the end of the presentation. It's in my top five. And then I can't really not mention Barry Lyndon, uh, Kubrick again. So he wanted to film scenes entirely by candlelight, you know, with, I think, 70 millimeter. He didn't have the lenses. Now, a lot of people thought that Kubrick invented uh, the lens to do this. But in fact, what he did was he he found out that NASA had commissioned from Carl Zeiss these lenses, which have an f-stop of 0.7, which is insane. If anyone knows camera photography, this is probably the lowest f-stop of any camera, of every lens in history. Six of them went to NASA. One was kept by Carl Zeiss. Three of them were sold by Kubrick. And if you ever see the Kubrick um, traveling exhibition, you can see one of these lenses and realize it's probably one of the most special lenses ever invented. And again, Kubrick just playing around. So this is Eyes Wide Shut. Love or hate, I love it. Um, high, whole parts of this film are filmed with nothing but Christmas lights. If you ever see this film again, it is so artificial, yet you don't really notice because you're caught up in the story of this nocturnal uh, journey that the um, Tom Cruise character is going through, in fact, all the characters. So everything is just Christmas lights in places that, I don't know, must, Woolworths must have been sold out that year. And then when the daylight comes through, it's this over-the-top artificial pervading blue. Was it Christmas, perhaps? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the bar scene is Christmas with, you know, up to up to 11. It's just ridiculous. But a very interesting film to watch. And I think colour tone is something which... Um, I know Sophie touched on, and I'm going to mention Solaris, really. But colour tone is something that's been used in very, very common television films for years. So this is Steven Soderbergh and Traffic. Traffic is a story, three stories in a film. So what you have is you choose a colour tone. You tell someone at the beginning, OK, this is Los Angeles. This is Tijuana in Mexico. And this is, I can't remember if this is Washington or something like that. You tell them at the beginning, you say the name, and after that, you trained, so you know when the story flips around, you don't have to keep telling people where they are. This color tone tells people. Hannibal um, and Ridley Scott used this to great effect in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in this film. And John Matheson, who I was fortunate enough to um, sit down to dinner with once and talk about his films, he was a cinematographer for this. He recently did Logan and Mary Queen of Scots. And he talked about this, playing around uh, all the daytime shots interiors. That he didn't want any... Uh, artificial lighting at all it was all natural light in um in the outside things he turned off all the sodium he wanted this artificial moonlight it's very much a stylistic film as far as telling the story of who's in what place and there's this lovely crossover so hannibal's in his his element he's in milan he's he's free he's doing what he wants to do and he writes letters uh, back to the fbi Every time you see him, he's in this warm glow of his study in the fbi is always this cold thing and there's this moment where she finds, she suddenly works out exactly where he is and what he's doing. And the color tone, not very subtly, changes. And after that, she knows. And she's on the way to finding where he is. And he used this effect, very interesting. This is a film pre-Bond that um, Daniel Craig made called Flashbacks of a Four. And I don't know if anyone's seen this. It's about a faded LA Hollywood star living in his mansion. And it flicks between his life now in this mansion in LA and his so sort of childhood life in, in the south, south coast of England in the 50s, very close to where I live now. And it was all filmed in Cape Town. It wasn't filmed anywhere in England or anywhere in L.A., but it looks and feels like it because John Matheson played with the colour tone very, very subtly to give you the expectation of what this would be like. And I think the, um, 
the greatest film, the greatest shock to people, if you ever see The Machinist, where everyone talks about the weight loss of Christian Bell just before he made Batman, this is sort of a, an industrial California. It's dark and everything's very green. Everything's always very, very mechanical and green. But this film was filmed in Barcelona. And, you know, everything inside, inside and outside were filmed in Barcelona. And again, it was a special use of colour tone to make you find a place for this film without really understanding um, uh, where it was filmed is irrelevant. It's about the colour tone. And I think the ultimate use of this is colour deprivation. So Stoderberg in Solaris, the Tarkovsky original is fantastic. But if you just want to look at a, peer of, a piece of sort of cinematography, the space scenes uh, in Solaris have this overriding palette of blues, greys, metallics. And it's not just style. It is a deliberate um, suffocation of removing the reds, the oranges, the warm colours from you to make you feel suffocated. And if you watch this, you do feel like something is not right, something is missing. And he did this to manipulate you. And as with other films, when there he goes to sleep or when he has memories and dreams, then the whole opposite happens. And you actually feel safe. This is nice. This is feel very, very relaxing. And when he wakes up, you're back. And he did this to emotionally manipulate you, knowing full well what uh, deprivation of color can do to people for just two hours of your life. So I, I had taken a lot from this when I did some artificial environments of giving people um, that full range of color in their lives. And to finish off, we talked about film noir. Well, this is the original version of Insomnia, uh, the Scandinavian version. The, the Al Pacino version, pretty good, but the original Stellan uh, Skargard version. This has been termed film blanc. This is a film where a detective travels to the northern uh, parts of uh, Scandinavia, I think it's in uh, Norway, and the sun is not going down. And he, as he goes for this film, cannot sleep. He tries, and as he cannot sleep, as he suffers from not, you know, sleep deprivation, your eyes start to water. And it's this pervading, bleached out, bright screen that gets you after an hour and a half. Really wonderful film. But also the fact is that when it finishes, you just want to turn the lights off. And I'll finish with my top five, uh, some of which I've mentioned. Alphaville, I think just watch it as a pure piece of sort of French new wave a way of approaching a detective sci-fi film and see how light becomes quite a scary um, uh, sort of protagonist in the film. Paris, Texas, we talk about DOP and everybody planning everything meticulously. Vim Vendors, this is a road movie. He basically had an outline script for this film. It's a beautiful film and discovered things every day traveling around uh, the Midwest. If he saw a sky or he saw a town that fitted they stopped and they set up and they filmed. So a lot of this film that you see is just by chance. And it just adapted the script to suit the location as he moved around. And yeah, I think with the Harry Dean Stanton passing away last year, it's a great way to see what a great actor he was. One from the heart. I don't think anyone would have seen this. So, um, Sophie, you mentioned the neon in Blade Runner. Well, one from the heart the year before, Francis Ford Coppola is, a, is, a, is his post-apocalyptic now apocalypse it almost killed him his studio it's it's a fantasy it's a cliched um romantic musical set in Ve in a fake vegas where he commissioned every uh, neon sign maker for six months to cover this film in, in neon a lot of that went to the blade runner set to dress the blade runner set so a lot of those neons are actually from this um it is I don't know, it's just a guilty pleasure, and there's something about it that's wonderful. Um, so if you haven't seen it as a lighting designer, I think you should see one from the heart. Uh, Latreau, I've mentioned, Jack Becker, this is really there because if anyone loves the Shawshank Redemption, if that feeling of knowing what happens through that film, you will love Latreau. I want to say nothing else about it. You can find it now online. And I have to finish on notes of blindness. This is a short film. Um, John Hull lost his sight shortly. He's a journalist and a writer. He lost his sight shortly after the birth of his first son. So he knew what it was like to see. But when he lost his sight, he collaborated to produce a film to try and convey what it is like to see without sight. And you can download this. I think it's on YouTube. Um, and it's about 15 minutes long. If you have a chance and you have an option to do VR through a headset or an Oculus or a Samsung gear, please watch this film because as light designers, we're always about how to light things, how do we perceive things and contrast. When you're blind, you only see or visualize with sound. So when it rains or when it's windy or there's more going on, you see more than when, you, when it's quiet 
or it's sunny or it's not windy. And I think the way this is conveyed is quite beautiful. And especially for our craft, when we're, we're looking at sighted people, is what maybe can we do for people that haven't got perfect sight? Because there's a lot that can be done in, in, a, in a, a, a visual environment that is not necessarily visual. And I think that's it. Is that the last slide? I believe so. Okay. Wonderful. Um, um, Martin, Sophie, Dan, um, a really, really interesting talk. Um, if you can hear a lot of noise in the background, I apologise. Some workmen have just started angle grinding the road outside of my window, which is great timing. Um, so um, there were a few um, kind of comments that came up uh, uh, throughout that really interesting presentation. So I will just refer to them. Um, Mike Tan asked, um, can we use lights to communicate, uh, for example, in uh, close encounters of the third kind? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Did, he, did they communicate with light? Did they communicate with sound? I'm trying to... <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think the short answer is yes, but then there's probably, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, of course we can. Yeah. <laughs> I'll move on. Matt Waring said, um, is it fair to say that sci-fi seems to provide the most room for exploration or experimentation in terms of lighting design? Hmm. I think fiction, you know, it doesn't have to be science fiction because I think fiction yeah. always allows you to take, you know, a, you know, two steps further perhaps because, it, you know, you're, you haven't got sort of a fixed point to sort of orientate around. I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's uh, you know, all genres allow you to have innovation. Um, but I think you can, you know, push boundaries perhaps slightly further in terms of you know, challenging the norm with a fiction-based uh, mm. medium. You know, like what Martin's saying about the computer screens being backlit because computers didn't exist. You know, like that. You know, that's some a technique that had to be developed specifically for that film for something that wasn't even invented yet. So perhaps I don't know. I, Martin, what's your take? Yeah, yeah. I think the end of the void is is an example of why sci-fi is not necessarily the craziest you can get if you can represent someone's state as mental state through the use of lighting and color in such a dramatic nauseating way and yeah. Gaston Noe is not the only time that he's done things like this <laughs> um I think that's I think there's there's just as much I think sci-fi there's an expectation and as yeah I think it's the lighting actually can be used in in the other in the other horror I think probably is the great yeah. yeah i was gonna say i think it's maybe the audience it's the people receiving it if they're open to it or not like they expect it with sci-fi they expect it with horror but things like enter the void that wasn't a storyline where that sort of lighting was expected which is what made it unique really but mm. yeah yeah i think i'm sort of pushing i think it's what drives and what pushes that boundary because you know that slip experiment in 2001 is a little bit like the enter the void transition you know that sort of that, you know the, the bleeding of the light sort of thing so yeah. i guess it's an egg thing isn't it it's where where those lessons are first conceived for use in other, in other mediums mm. yeah it's true um okay a couple of comments um todd said he's surprised that nobody mentioned jack tatty um i'm gonna be honest with you not hugely familiar with his work but uh martin uh i know i'm not a fan i don't uh yeah Okay, Todd, you're wrong. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay. Um, you can ask all the questions. <laughs> Vim Vendors, um, or Wim, Wim Wenders, Vim, Vim Vendors, um, uh, Paris, Texas, uh, yeah. Berlin, uh, Wings of Desire uh, was also fantastic. Has anyone? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I think Vim Vendors is, I kind of, he's kind of, again, I, th I think he's still making documentaries and films. It's just really, really naturalistic and i think he has an idea and he doesn't he doesn't design the arse out of it he, he keeps it open and just to sort of go in different directions and i think visually it's it's kind of a sort of cross between a home movie and a documentary but it's still a mainstream story movie so I, i'm a real big fan of him and i think yeah uh, wings of desire they're, they're all brilliant films i just love the way that he he sees something and changes um must be a nightmare to work from as an actor but um <laughs> um right uh, i think it was nilesh who also mentioned uh, visions of light is a great documentary mm. featuring well-known cinematographers who discuss their approach to light in cinema i don't know where you can see that i'm it might be netflix i guess but um, I, i've got a dvd of it from back <laughs> in the day it must be somewhere 
um but it's brilliant it is really really good and um yeah anyone's a light designer will, will get a lot out of it okay um right quickly flicking through these um uh kevin did say yeah a bit of a slap on the wrist for everybody would have liked would have been nice to have seen the cinematographer uh, or the director of photography credit. Yeah. so agreed uh, apologies to the film Sorry, buff, uh, amongst us um <laughs> So, uh, and then Gordon Willis, who shot the God, uh, Nilesh uh, said, Gordon Willis, who shot the Godfather part one and two, is known as the Prince of Darkness. Uh, thoughts? Maybe he grew up watching film noir as an influence. <laughs> He's right, yeah. He, the, the, the shots in the Godfather for a mainstream movie are quite dark, especially the interiors. Yeah. Um, I didn't actually realise it was the same for, uh, cinematographer for one and two. I, don't, I just, again, maybe... DOPs are not talked about enough, as is writers or editors not mentioned enough. But um, mm. we'll architectural, also architectural lighting designers in the architectural. Exactly. Not, not, not <laughs> acknowledged. Always the unsung heroes. Um, Kevin, uh, thank you. Kevin mentioned that apparently Visions of Light is all available on YouTube. Oh, God. Uh, awesome. Also available on YouTube are the previous seven of these uh, webinars. You see what I did there? Wonderful. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can watch the, uh, the previous seven of these webinars as well. Um, Karen Owens, thank you. 1917. I had seen 1917 yet. Oh, I haven't seen it. All the cinemas shut before I could go. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, definitely on Sky Cinema now. I know that. But uh, um, uh, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, right. I think that's probably us wrapping up. Um, just to say thank you to everybody um, who has uh, attended uh, today and uh, the previous uh, webinars as well. Uh, Lou Boccatello uh, said he's attended all of them. So um, thank you. That's uh, very much appreciated. Um, later on this afternoon, I did post in the little box in the corner. Um, later on this afternoon, the Nullity team will be taking over uh, the ILP, the Inst in Institute of Lighting Professionals highlight session. So you, it's a pretty much an ask us anything session. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to talk quite candidly about all things light and coronavirus and webinars and, and anything anybody wants to talk to um, us about. So um, we will be there from three o'clock this afternoon. Um, I think all that is left for me to say is a huge thank you to you, Martin, for, for joining us and special guest starring. Uh, thank I you so like much for inviting me. You've brightened up, well, two days, because we had a <laughs> In a movie way, I feel like there should be some credits rolling now. So yeah, I, yeah. I, uh, I apologize. Um, and uh, yeah, to Dan, to Sophie, uh, thank um, you very, very much. Um, for, for that it was a wonderful uh, presentation i'm going to play us out with a song in, in a very cheesy kind of way because i feel it's the most apt thing so um to everybody thank you again for joining us uh, and hopefully we will see you again um thank you thank you <laughs>